Uh, well, good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Keith Charters, and I have several roles. I have several roles. Uh, I work for the Cultural Enterprise Office, as David has said, as the Specialist Literature Advisor, and I work there with both authors and publishers, uh, so it's a bit of a mixture. Switching hats, I also run Strident Publishing, which focuses on or specialises in children's, teenage, young adult, and some young adult, adult crossover fiction, and we only, we only do fiction. Um, I'm also an author in my own right, so I write the Lee series of children's books, and uh, on top of all that, I'm the treasurer of Publishing Scotland. So I'm coming at this from several different angles and wearing several different hats. But the main ones I want to wear, the main one I want to wear today is that of, of publisher. And the stage that we're at at the moment is one of relative confusion, I think. Anyone who can stand up here today and say, this is what it looks like right now, and this is what it'll look like in five years' time, I think is probably kidding themselves. But that's not to say that we can't look at where we're at and have some guess as to the direction of travel. So that's what I want to, to do a little bit today. So here are the four steps that I want to go through. Revolution, which is what we've kind of had already, but we're still going through. Confusion, which we definitely have at present. Evolution, some of which we have, but I'm sure a lot of which is still to come. And then what I've called resolution, because digital, publish, digital, digital publishing is like any evolving industry in that you know, it starts off with chaos and then people try lots of different things. Some of them work, most of them don't, and eventually we get to the point where, where things settle down. So by the time we get to resolution, I'll be trying to do my, have my Nostradamus uh, moment and predict what might happen in the future, it, with the difference, important difference, that I hope to be alive to find out whether or not my prophecies come true. So let's look at revolution just briefly. Uh, where, what's happened so far and, and what perhaps is still happening. As far as digital publishing is concerned, timing has been absolutely everything. You know, they used to say location, location, location for estate agents. For publishers, it's timing, timing, timing. There was no point in converting your entire list into, uh, into e-books at a time when nobody had something they could read an e-book on. It just did not make sense. But I think we're getting to that point now where device ownership, the number of Kindles and Kobos and, uh, and Nukes and all the rest of it, has taken us over that tipping point. Now it does make sense for publishers to, to look at this as a commercially viable marketplace in addition to what they might think of as their traditional marketplace, the print marketplace. So we've reached that point and frankly there is no turning back. In fact, if there's a direction of travel, it's more likely to be more towards the, the, the digital format than it is towards print. But one of the things I want to consider is whether both can coexist, and if so, to what extent. There is a very big question, and that is if suddenly everything is out there and, um, and a lot of it might be made available for free or very, very cheaply, and if the barriers to entry are very low because you know, anybody, you know, anybody in this room who has no digital experience in publishing at all can go on and create, a, create an e-book using some of the technologies out there. Will anyone actually make money out of it? And if no one makes money out of it, does that mean actually that traditional publishing will, will die? Um, and if traditional publishing dies, what impact does that have on authors? Now, that's not a subject I'm going to go into. I, I suspect that you and might talk on about some of that later on. But it's something that I think we need to have at the back of our minds. So let's look at the confusion that we're at, the stage that we're, I think we're really in still at, at present. One of the issues is that there are multiple formats out there. We're, we're in that, uh, you know, um, VHS versus Betamax uh, stage still, where we've got Mobi, pre predominantly used for Kindles. We've got uh, EPUB, which is a little bit more, um, uh, which is, which is you know, transferable and used on things like Kobos. Uh, we've got PDFs, which are sort of almost like a, a world of their own off, over to one side. Um, and those can be read on, on most of those devices, although not necessarily 
uh, in, a, in a terribly user-friendly way, or at least not yet. We've also got this question of, should there be portability? And actually, does anybody want portability? Uh, by portability, I mean, what I mean is that you can read it on, let's say, your phone, and then you, you get to work having read it on your phone, and you go, because it's quiet day in the office, you go, do you know, I think I'll read it on the PC now. Um, and then you get back on the way home, you think, actually, I want to read it on my tablet now. So it's, it's that issue of whether you can transfer it between several different devices. Is that important? One of the big American publishers, uh, Tor, uh, who are actually about to, to launch uh, a series of books that, that we have published in the UK, they have gone entirely the portability route. They, they believe that their, their audience, their target audience, and they publish into the fantasy sector, so maybe that says something about people who read fantasy, that they absolutely want that portability. In fact, it's almost the most important thing to them, that they might not even buy any Tor books if it can't be made portable. Now, I'm not sure I entirely go along with that, but you know, they clearly have the reasons for believing that. The, an almost related subject is that of digital rights management. To what extent do you protect the work that's, that's on your book? Um, if I've got it on, it's on, on your, your, uh, your laptop or your, your tablet or, or your phone, you know, should I be able to, a bit like a physical book, go, that was fantastic. Um, do you want to borrow it? Can I pass that on to somebody else? And there's a lot of discussion at the moment around the library sector where um, you could say there's a conflict of interest. Publishers, on the one hand, entirely understandably, for economic reasons, are thinking to themselves, now, wouldn't it be great if we could sell a library a book once and once only, and the next time somebody wanted to borrow it, they had to pay all over again? Fantastic. That's, that's you know, a market opportunity. Equally, libraries are going to be coming out from the perspective of, well, at the moment we buy one book and we, we flog it to the death, we keep lending it until it's falling apart and has to be thrown in the bin or put on the uh, for sale table. Um, so we, actually, we don't want to do that. We want to, to make sure that, you know, that we're getting as much value for money as is possible. So there's a real conflict there, and that's still not resolved. The same company, though, Tor, I just mentioned a moment ago, have decided, and they're the first big publisher really to do this, to completely remove digital rights management from all of their publications. And I get the sense that there's a feeling in the industry that a few years from now, that might be the norm. And part of it, I think, is maybe that we're trying to protect something that, that as publishers, we see having enormous value. But actually, a 6 99 paperback how much of an effort is somebody going to make to try and get hold of that free of charge? Are they going to go, it's only £6.99, let's just go to the shop or online and just, and just order it. That's the easiest way. So I think that's still to be resolved, but there is a direction of travel, and the direction of travel is towards taking digital rights management off of, uh, of electronic books. I'll come back to this question of who should sell e-books in a moment. But there's this big question of how much should they cost? Because if they cost 20 pence, and if the author is only going to receive a share of that, and it's probably not going to be the majority share of it, then nobody's going to get very rich quick. And if every book I ever sold as a publisher was going to be 20 pence, uh, then I'd pack up my bags and just go home tomorrow. So that's not a workable model. So we need to think about how as an industry, how we convince people that there is value in what we sell and how we set the expectations. One of the misconceptions I think that people have, and it's a big misconception, is that ebooks, well, they're cheap to produce, aren't they? Well, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that I can very easily convert, very cheaply convert, an existing print book file into an electronic format. Yeah, that's easier. You just whack it through a system. You know, it really isn't expensive. But what people don't see, I think, when they're thinking about electronic books is, about e-books, is everything that goes on beyond the before the point at which it's converted, because that book still has to be edited. That book still has to be marketed um, to the trade, who perhaps are you know, the traditional trade, but also to the electronic trade as well. 
Copies still have to be sent to reviewers. Reviewers don't like reading electronic copies, they want a physical copy. And also, there's the issue of cannibalisation. Because am I selling more books overall, or am I selling the same number of books but in two different formats now? Am I selling 10,000 books but 5,000 are physical and 5,000 are, are in are e-books? So I've not, I haven't actually got more books over which to spread the, the overhead, the cost of editorial and all the rest of it, maybe offices and such like. Um, so I, th I think people view them as cheap to produce because they are as standalone items, but not if you have done all the traditional and I would say necessary publishing work of editorial to get the books into a shape where they are of good quality. And quality is an issue which we need to, to touch on. Who should be paid for the content? I would argue that if it's good content, if it is content that has, has some sort of quality control applied to it, and that's editorial, then authors and publishers should be paid for the work that they are producing. And I also think there's a, an imperative on the users because and the readers, if they're not paying anybody for that, they simply won't get the same quality. There is a big question as to whether a digital-only publishing business is sustainable. But I actually think we have to look at that the other way around as well. Because I would say there's an equally big question as to whether a print-only publishing business is now sustainable. I think that in much the same way as a lot of traditional publishers have embraced digital printing, I think a lot of what start off as digital-only publishers are starting to look effectively back the way and see if they can monetize, or part of the way of monetizing their output is to, to go and you know, create it as an e-book, but then simply to print it, because you can do it in both ways. So let's look at some of the uh, evolution. I think I'm somewhere about in the middle uh, of that particular picture. We've had things like enhanced e-books, now, I understand where these come from because there's a sudden sort of rush and, you know, e-books ha are sort of limitless po have limitless possibilities. So let's try everything and see what works. See if anything works. Some of it's going to work, but you have to try, you know, it's like, it's always the way you have to try everything to find out what works. Um, people have spent a lot of money on enhanced e-books and sold some. But that doesn't necessarily make them a bad thing because it's a bit like a lost leader. You might spend a lot of money on this and then find that you sell an awful lot more of your standard B format, your traditional books that you see in the bookshop because of the awareness that's raised by having the enhanced ebook in the first place. So some of the things I think we're seeing are not necessarily products in their own right. Well, they are, they exist as products, but their primary purpose is perhaps to, to, to is more a marketing as a marketing tool, it's to raise awareness. One of the interesting developments, I think we're just at that point of starting to see now, is, is what I call bulk switching. And this could, if it continues, very rapidly grow the digital publishing marketplace. I, I'm aware of a school in Aberdeen, I don't know if you've read this in the, in the, in the media, um, where and it's a state school, it's not a private school, where all of the children now use tablets. I think specifically iPads. All the curriculum of the school is delivered via iPads. Now, if they are doing that, I can see that it's not necessarily going to be all that long before places like this, if they don't already, uh, do something similar. And then that starts to raise issues of, well, does that take us really beyond a certain tipping point in, for example, uh, educational publishing? Is it even worth producing at some point in the future a physical book? Should everything be designed on the assumption that it's going to be primarily used as, a, as an e-book? So I think that's a very interesting um, development. Then we've got this issue of discovery. Now, discovery in an electronic world, I think, is very, very difficult. Because, as I've said there, you know, if, if, everything, if anyone can produce anything they want, at effectively zero cost, how do you know which is the good stuff? And there's an awful lot of it. And I want to talk about branding in, in, a, little, in a little minute, because I think branding has quite an important part, to, role to play, and a different role to play from the role that it plays 
at the moment. I'll come back to this uh, either or versus either and uh, in just a second. Let's talk about that issue of branding now. One of the, at the moment, publishers, brands, don't really mean anything to, to you, to, to me as, as a book buyer. I don't go into the bookshop, don't go into Waterstones and go, oh, brilliant, there's a new book out by Harper Collins, I must buy it. I'm interested principally in the author, maybe I'm interested in the genre and so on. But to the buyers within the stores, that brand is important. The fact it has Harper Collins or Strident Publishing or Cole or whatever on there conveys to them what they can expect from that book. Now, if we're not buying our books from Waterstones and so on, who have done some of that gatekeeping for us, who have gone, well, there are billions of books out there, let's narrow it down to, to just a couple of million. Um, and then let's put them in, in, into categories to make it easier for people to, to work out what they actually want, then perhaps we're going to start relying a little bit more on the brands that the author, that the, sorry, that the, um, that the publisher is putting forward, as well as what we already do, which is think about the author brand. You know, Ian Rankin, for example, he is he's an author, but he is a brand in effect. You know exactly what you're going to get from one of his books. So, I'll come on to that, talk about what I think might happen in that in just a second. I also think, and I think this might be something that Leila will talk a little bit about, um, there's going to be an awful lot more in the way of direct marketing to consumers. And I don't mean the junk mail coming through your letterbox, you might be pleased to know. But different ways in which publishers can get in contact directly with their potential readers. Because at the moment, the traditional model is that you put up an advert in the underground and you hope that the right people see it. And that kind of advertising is really expensive. And it's also very much a shotgun approach. It's kind of like, like, let's just chuck it out there and hope the right people see it. With things like social media and building communities, you can be much, much more targeted. It's much easier to reach the people you want. Um, and importantly, even to interact with them, which is something you could never do before. So I think we will see much more about that, but I don't want to steal anybody else's thunder. Right, so how does this just all, how do all the pieces of this, this jigsaw come together? I think there's every possibility that we will see, in terms of the formats, this issue of Moby and EPUB and the rest of it, coexisting. Because we've got PCs and, there's one facing me here, and a Mac. And those work together, and they speak to each other. We've, we've worked around the fact that those different formats exist and we've managed to get them to all speak to each other, thankfully. Um, so I can see that this is not an, uh, you know, will we have VHS or Betamax? Actually, we, we could have in publishing the equivalent of both and we'll just find a workaround that means that they are more portable, that they can be used effectively on, on any system. I think that Every, ultimately, every publisher five years from now will be doing print and electronic. I cannot see a role for doing just one or the other. There aren't really, I would say, even any only print uh, publishers at the moment. Those who may only produce in print at, at present, I think have largely, a bit like we have until, until now, because you know, bear in mind that we're in the children's marketplace and the teenage and young adult, and children's, there aren't many seven-year-olds running around with 100-pound Kindles yet. Uh, I'm sure that will, that will come. Um, so we made a conscious decision in that part of the marketplace not to switch yet. But that, you know, I always think that a conscious decision is, a, is nonetheless a decision. It's not just that we were taken by surprise uh, in terms of that. So I think everybody will do both. I also think that there will be more e-tailers. Now, I think we all know who the big one is at present, but people like Random House are start, starting to talk about setting up, not, I wouldn't say quite in competition, because I don't think they're promoting it that way yet for reasons that are probably entirely understandable, but I do think that they have a huge brand name and it allows them to go direct to the public. It allows them to sell their product to, um, to people in a way that those people themselves may not have thought about yet. And I think that might change um, the branding, because I think 
in the way that you have things like uh, Virgin, it's Virgin Money, it's Virgin, well, it was Virgin Trains, uh, Virgin Airlines and Virgin Cosmetics and Virgin, Virgin Everything. Uh, I think at the moment, the way that we often talk about imprints, you know, Chicken House, well, well who owns Chicken House? Um, you know, probably most people don't know, but if you, if you start talking about Random House or if they start to promote their name or Harper Collins, some of those big brands, you might well start to go to their website and then buy directly from them. Now, that's very attractive for them because for publishers selling through Amazon, Amazon take about a 60% cut of everything that we sell. It's a huge chunk of money. So the incentive to undo that, to sell direct, is enormous. And I think that's something that the big publishing houses are, are very aware of, and particularly Random House seem to have started to talk about ways in which they can do that. So I think the branding will start to shift from being directed towards the trade to being directed towards the public. And social media will be very important in, in, uh, in playing a role in that. I also think there's going to be more collaboration between traditional publishers and those who have initially set up as digital publishers. They have a set of skills that traditional publishers might not necessarily have in-house. They might not want to have them in-house. So I can see quite a lot of, of it, you know, work going backwards and forwards between the two. So even if they're not actually part, they don't necessarily merge, it will almost be as if they have done so. And I also think there'll be some consolidation. I think inevitably that process is going to, I mean, it, maybe it's just starting at the moment. There have been a few purchases and mergers happening. I can see an awful lot more of that. Partly driven by this new focus on intellectual property. Because I think what publishers are realising is that traditionally they have printed something, seen if it works, doesn't work, they stop printing it, stop publishing it. Now they're starting to go, do you know what, acquiring new stuff is actually really expensive. What have we got over here? Oh well, look, do you know, I think we could maybe make a bit more use of that. Perhaps we could animate that. Maybe, maybe we could take that and take it to a new market. Maybe things that couldn't find the market before actually can find the market now. So I think there'll be that process of consolidation. P companies will buy other companies because they see potential in their list that they think that that company hasn't seen. So I think there'll be fewer big publishers, but an awful lot of small publishers sort of right around about the edges some of which will act almost as de development labs for the big publishers. There was a period where that happened a few years back in traditional publishing, and then it kind of went away, but I, I can see that coming back again. So, that's what I think is going to happen. <laughs>